and welcome to your most obedient and humble servant. This is a women's history podcast where we feature 18th and early 19th century women's letters that don't get as much attention as we think they should. I'm your host, Catherine Garrett. Today's episode is, again, going to be a little bit different than our normal format. First of all, this is our first two-parter episode, uh, and the reason for that is that the letter that we're doing this week is so long <laughs> that it takes just in and of itself pretty much the entirety of this episode. So this week is going to be the letter, and then next episode is going to be the discussion and analysis of that letter. My guest this week is a good friend of mine and public historian extraordinaire Lizzie Thomas. Lizzie is currently pursuing her master's degree in sustainability from Wake Forest University, but she's spent the past several years working as a uh, in-person I called her a live action interpreter, but apparently that's not correct. Uh, she is a costumed interpreter at Colonial Williamsburg, where she played a number of different characters. So she is an actress and historian, and she, I thought, would be a good choice to read this letter that it really requires somebody who uh, knows what they're doing. I'll just give you a little bit of context before we go into this letter. Uh, this is from Elizabeth Park Custis Law, who, if you have listened to uh, an earlier episode, episode seven, Strange Most Passing Strange, uh, we discussed Elizabeth and her marriage quite a bit in that episode. This is Martha Washington's granddaughter, Elizabeth Park Custis Law. She was something of a spitfire. She had a very unusual life. Um, she married a West India uh, nabob, so somebody who made his fortune over in West India and then came over to the United States named Thomas Law. Uh, who her grandparents didn't completely approve of because he seemed like he was a little bit of a social striver. He's very much new money, um, and he was definitely trying to profit off of buying land in Washington, D.C. as soon as that became the new United States capital. Um, but she ignored any advice and married Thomas Law. He also had uh, brought with him uh, two sons from a previous liaison with a woman in India. So he had two mixed race sons that he had actually brought over from India with him that Elizabeth Park Custis Law helped raise. Interestingly, she doesn't mention those two sons in this letter, but that's some background that I think uh, is important. So the form that I found this letter in was published in the Virginia Magazine of History and Biography, volume 53, number two, April 1945. Uh, and so it was edited and introduced by an author named William D. Hoyt Jr. He was not able to find the entirety of the letter. He only has about, I guess, maybe half of it, uh, and that I wasn't able to find the rest of it either. So the half of it that was published is what we're reading. So this is a letter written on April 20th, 1808, from Elizabeth Park Custis Law to David Bailey Warden. Um, David Bailey Warden is an Irish Republican who had been exiled to the United States for his role in the insurrection, uh, and he later became an American consul to France. Um, and he was apparently friendly with Elizabeth. Uh, there's some discussion on what their relationship was actually like. But this letter she wrote shortly after he had left to be consul. And we have 29 manuscript pages of it. And that's not even the whole thing. She writes the letter as an autobiography. It's Elizabeth Park Custis Law's story of her own life. And it's a little bit of her saying, do you know who I am? <laughs> and you can get that vibe throughout the letter. She was 32 years old when she wrote this. Uh, she and her husband had separated four years previous, but they weren't yet officially divorced. And she's writing this to someone who I guess is her friend. I don't know why she feels so betrayed and that she has to write this really long letter to him specifically. Uh, I'm not sure if she wants him to deliver it to law. The context of that is a little bit unclear. So I believe that's enough context. Uh, with that, I will send it over to Lizzie uh, as she reads this letter. And thank you very much for listening. April 20th, 1808. My dear friend, I take the pen to write a narrative of my life, from my earliest recollection to this time. However deficient it may be in other respects, it shall have the merit of truth and candor. I wish not to appear better than I am. But justice to myself imperiously calls upon me to tell the story of a life which, although not a very long one, 
has been marked with events of no common order the world knows little of me and it may possibly continue in ignorance i speak to one who shall know all i can tell of myself who after proofs of regard which no other would have dared to give now shrouds in mysterious silence all which concerns himself and wounds the bosom of his friend by suffering her to continue ignorant of his detonation and to feel the painful conviction that he deems her unworthy of his confidence the family from which i am a descendant was among the first settlers of virginia i know not exactly from whence they came but think i recollect being told they were from some part of flanders this may be a mistake but tis not material they possessed wealth at the time of their establishment and by good management became proprietors of some among the most valuable lands on the eastern shore and lower counties of the state they inhabited i have always felt pride in hearing that all who had borne the name of custis were honest and just men a circumstance more to be prized in the opinion of their descendants than all the pomp of heraldry or wealth could give had they even been destitute of them the father of my father was a good man possessed of a great estate a pleasing person of unblemished reputation he at an advanced age married miss dandridge to whom in her infancy he had been godfather and often dandled on his knee the smiling cherub who was one day to be his wife and afterwards the wife of general washington he made a most affectionate indulgent husband to the most charming woman of the age she lived in four children were the pledges of their union two of them died in infancy and the loss of his eldest son so preyed upon the sensibility of my grandfather that he pined in sorrow which not all his other blessings could dissipate and sunk into the grave leaving his youthful consort with a large dowry and a lovely girl and boy to engage those affections he had shared with them she was worthy of the approbation which her virtues obtained all who ever knew her and after a period of widowhood in which her correct conduct added to the esteem with which she had been regarded she was selected by washington to be the partner of his happiness and his country's love the first of men chose her as his wife the companion of a life of glory and well did she repay his confidence and attachment ever honoured spirit of my revered an ever lamented parent look down upon thy child how little did thy fond heart think that when caressing thy darling eliza she would one day be the victim of slander and persecution and with a heart oft lacerated by the neglect of the friend most dear to her should now commence a narrative of her life and family to convince him that he does not know her who he once vowed to love for ever to thy spotless soul i can appeal for the purity of my attachment and rectitude of my intentions with the hand of mrs custis general washington received a large fortune and became the guardian of her son and daughter they removed to mount vernon where he procured a tutor to instruct the children and where his wife acquired the esteem and admiration of all who saw her he was a father to her children and desirous to give my father every advantage placed him at the school kept by parson boucher he was the handsomest youth of his day to judge of his person tis only necessary to observe that his children who have been thought handsome are some of them to be compared to him at the age of sixteen he became acquainted with the family of mr calvert of maryland and soon fell desperately in love with my mother then only fourteen she was beauteous as an angel my father saw her and loved for his whole life he was but a boy and although his offered heart was accepted by my mother and her family exulted in her conquest it was thought best to insist upon his going to new york 
to acquire advantages of education which could not at that time be procured more near his parents and sister visited her were highly delighted with the proposed alliance and besought her influence to prevail on him to leave her and attend to those studies necessary to complete his education after much contention with his family the entreaties of the lovely girl he felt such reluctance to leave induced him to go that he might render himself more worthy of her i now leave him in new york to which place general washington accompanied him and returned to mount vernon where my mother had gone to spend some time the sister of my father was an amiable girl dutiful to her parents she adored her brother and was much attached to his intended wife she had bad health and when my father had been eighteen months at new york she was sitting with my mother talking of her dear john and said she would go to bring one of his letters my mother heard a noise and going to her room found the amiable girl on the floor without breath she was put to bed her mother frantic at her situation ran about seeking assistance my mother bathed in tears leant over her and the godlike man who afterwards saved his country kneeling by the bed solemnly recited the prayers for the dying while tears rolled down his cheeks and his voice was often broken by sobs the angel of death hovered over and snatched his prey from her afflicted friends thus deprived of one darling child my father was sent for to console his mother his faith was unchanged by absence and he brought back a heart uncontaminated by intercourse with a world of which he was a brilliant ornament many efforts had been made to supplant the woman he loved all efforts proved unavailing of a respectable family large fortune and a person beauteous as the god of love mothers sought to engage his attentions to their daughters and many a lovely girl attempted to captivate the young virginian warm and unchangeable his heart when fixed was incapable of perfidy and desertion and he came back if possible more devoted to his eleanor than when they parted he swore he would not leave her again had wished to be married at once but his impetuosity was so far controlled that he was kept single till the age of nineteen when arrived at that age and my mother not sixteen they were united i have been told that when arrayed in white which was the fashion of the day and standing in the midst of their numerous connections to receive the nuptial benediction they looked as if some inhabitants of celestial regions had descended to gladden the children of earth he was the most ardent lover the most enraptured husband he loved his wife to excess and thought there was no heaven but in her arms they resided at mount vernon the difference with england soon began he was ready to fly to arms and wished to follow washington to battle but the prayers of his mother the entreaties and caresses of his wife had power to alter his determination he sacrificed the wish his ardent love had burnt to gratify and was satisfied to exchange glory for happiness eighteen months had elapsed since their union when my parents were blessed with a daughter who was the first pledge of love such as few can feel but while her fond parents gazed upon her each day with new delight she was attacked by a violent illness and died to relieve my mother's distress was her husband unremitting care and he carried her with his mother to visit general washington then encamped near boston they passed a pleasant time though often alarmed with fears of the british whose bombs burst frequently over the place of their residence my mother's situation required her return to her father's house where twelve months after the birth of their first child your friend came to supply her loss better had it been for her to have died as did her sister but fate decreed otherwise 
and my fond parents weaned their child with the partiality that parents feel i had the smallpox i was attacked by the whooping cough which almost killed me but i was not destined to die till sufferings more terrible should make existence a burthen sixteen months after my birth my sister peter succeeded and at the same distance of time mrs lewis came to gladden the hearts of her friends my mother had twins two girls who died in three weeks and soon after my brother was born ere this my father had purchased the place where you once went with me abingdon and the other which my brother now holds named arlington from the old family seat of the custises on the eastern shore of virginia he established his household in a handsome style and his house became the seat of hospitality his love for his family if possible increased each year he was adored by his servants admired by all who saw him and those who knew him deemed themselves honored in calling him their friend my noble father thou wert encased of all that was good in man and the honest pride spent in recounting thy merits makes me exult in the reflection that i am worthy to be thy child my father's house was the resort of the alexandrians and all genteel strangers found a welcome at his board among the number was an english physician whose name was rumney he played well on the flute and took delight in making me sing i soon attained excellence in this science and was always lifted on the dinner-table to sing for my father's guests i had a good memory and learnt many songs my father and dr r taught me many very improper ones and i can now remember standing on the table when not more than three or four years old singing songs which i did not understand while my father and other gentlemen were often rolling in their chairs with laughter and i was animated to exert myself to give him delight the servants in the passage would join their mirth and i holding my head erect would strut about the table to receive the praises of the company my mother remonstrated in vain and her husband always said his little bet could not be injured by what she did not understand that he had no boy and she must make fun for him until he had he would then kiss her to make his peace and giving me a nod my voice which was uncommonly powerful for my age resounded through the rooms my mother who could not help laughing had to retire and leave me to the gentlemen where my father's caresses made me think well of myself think me not vain all who saw me then know i had an uncommonly fine voice for so young a child i was the darling of my grandmother washington she had all that tenderness of manner which my father had and when with her i was always in her arms my heart almost broke when she was obliged to go to the general and i was always talking of her and wishing her return many things occurred at that early period of my life which made an indelible impression i will mention one event which i have never forgotten going with the other children into a house where the negroes picked cotton i took a cotton seed and put it up my nose that night i suffered great pain but my father reproving me for complaining i stifled my groans and lay in much misery till morning he called me to him and after many efforts got out the seed then saying with sternness you have kept me awake all night and distressed both your parents by doing this now i will punish you to prevent your thus acting again he then laid me across his knee and whipped me severely when he put me down my proud heart swelled with anger i did not mind the pain he inflicted but he had disgraced me before the other children for a circumstance which only injured me had he spoken one kind word i should have been subdued 
but I thought he was unjust. I felt he had degraded me. I resolved not to incur humiliation again, and do not recollect his correcting me after this time. Another event would, to a reflecting mind, have marked the color of my future life. Dr. William Reed of South Carolina spent some time at my grandfather Calvert's, where a relation of his resided. My sister Peter was the pet of that family, and Dr. R. was fond of her, but on my arrival, he became much more partial to me. I was four years old, and he said, I was the most interesting child he had seen. I took an equal fancy to him. He walked out with me, read and talked with me, and I would sit on his knee, sing for him, and often when my nurse came to take me to bed, was found asleep with my little arms twined around his neck. He could not leave me a moment. When he was obliged to return to Carolina, he delayed his departure as long as possible. For fearing he would go, I never left him for a moment, and clinging round his neck would beg so earnestly that he would not go, that he was often affected by my distress. He wished I was sixteen, as he feared some cold-hearted wretch would one day make his darling miserable, and would then vent execrations by anticipation against him who should not know how to value my heart. He went away, and avoided taking leave of me. I was frantic, rushing out of the house to follow him, and was so much afflicted as to be seriously sick. The family tried to console me, but in vain, and they could only restrain my tears by assurances that my friend would return. My little sisters stood round and offered to comfort me. Don't cry, Betsy, he will come back again, was repeated by all. But it was a long time before I regained tranquility. My father contemplated this scene with concern. God grant, my child, that I may live to protect you. With feelings ardent and uncontrollable as mine, I too plainly foresee you will suffer greatly. The proud spirit which breaks forth whenever excited tells me my child will never do a mean or dishonorable action. But too surely I fear she will be miserable. The words of my father were prophetic. He was soon to be snatched from his wife and infant children. Had he lived, I had perhaps been happy. My father was an enthusiast in the cause of his oppressed country, and but for the reasons before assigned, would have been foremost among her defenders. I sung all the revolutionary songs, and used to talk of tar and feather for the Tories. Whenever my father could, he always went to the army, and... When the siege of York was nearly concluded, he hastened to see the surrender of Cornwallis. I recollect well how averse he seemed to set off returning several times to bid his family farewell. I was sick in bed, for he came to the side of it, kissed and blessed me many times, and tore himself away. Alas, it was decreed he should nev never should return and I was the only one of his children who saw him after that day. He arrived at the camp of Washington and saw the British humbled before him, but the camp fever assailed him, and his mother and wife were summoned to attend him. I was their companion, and was grieved to see the late blooming face of my beloved father so changed that I should not have known him but for his voice. All was done that medical skill and fond affection could perform to save him. My mother never left him. Seated on his bed, his eyes were fastened on her. His love had known no change. It was hard to die so young. He was not more than twenty-seven years old when the cruel spoiler came and tore him from a world which he adorned. When told my father was no more, I insisted on seeing him. My nurse was going with me to the room, but we were stopped. I was full of indignation, and said they had no right to prevent my seeing him. I called upon him to return to me. 
and said i supposed my mother would marry some one else but no other man should ever be my father i well recollect the grief of my mother and grandmother and travelling up the country again all clad in black my father's generous soul had made him too little attentive to pecuniary concerns he had never been brought up with any knowledge of business he made bad bargains and had greatly injured his estate he sold some fine lands in the lower country and received paper money in payment my mother was twenty-five of a gay turn high spirits which had been nurtured by a life of unchanging prosperity ere a very long time she acquired resignation to her loss and began to mingle with a world which always admired her still the full bloom of beauty with an ample fortune she was sought by all who wished to secure happiness or fortune she attracted admiration whenever she appeared mounted on an elegant horse which she rode well she was certainly a most captivating object i mourned for my father and wondered she could forget him and well convinced am i that had i been so beloved by so charming a husband i should have followed him to the grave but tis most fortunate for her that she is different from me and i wish no one so ill and to feel so deeply so durably as i do two years after my father's departure my mother gave her hand to dr stuart she chose the man who she believed would make the best guardian for her children dr s was not then the gloomy mortal he has been since he had just returned from europe where he received every advantage of education and was one of the most learned men of his day he was a man of respectable family and a character free from reproach he had studied the profession of medicine and i believe was qualified to make a conspicuous figure in it he had little fortune and my mother's friends disapproved of the choice she made but she was independent of them and finding herself incapable of managing her own or her children's property determined to marry dr s who became her husband and the guardian of her children's fortune my youngest sister and brother went to reside at mount vernon and now my heart sustained another pang the old woman who had nursed my father nursed all his children she was sent to take care of the youngest ones who needed her but i was her darling and felt sincere affection for her she wept over me at parting and soon after the wagon which carried her away till i was brought back by force the greatest pleasure i knew was to go to mount vernon and when i left i look at the house till i could see it no longer then covering my face with my hands would cry till i fell asleep my mother was pained that i loved her less than my grandmother patty was of a different turn she was the favorite of my mother's family of whom i was less fond an old lady the aunt of dr reed idolized me and when in that house i was generally at her side being like other old maids very positive she could not hear the others should prefer patty and declaring her pet was worth a dozen of her so sensible a child was never seen and she would carry me off to her own room where every word i uttered was noted as an indication of extraordinary talents my heart possessed the feelings of my father although fond of those who were kind to me the baneful passion of envy found to enhance in my bosom and i thought my sister had as just a claim to affection as i had we were constantly together yet never were alike she was fortunately for herself created like other people and has passed a happy life while her sister has been often miserable we were taught our letters to spell and read by my mother and a miss allen a cousin of dr reed who lived at mount airy my grandfather calvert's seat i made a more rapid progress than common the family said and the prizes bestowed upon my capacity stimulated me to acquire what was given me to learn soon 
After my mother's second marriage, my sister, now Mrs. Robinson, was added to our family. I was then eight years old. The servants of the house incited some jealousy by making me observe my mother's fondness for her infant. But when these unpleasant thoughts would rise, I thought of my grandmamma Washington and Mammy Molly, my old nurse, who always overwhelmed me with caresses when I visited Mount Vernon, and from whom I was ever afflicted to part. My father-in-law willed to give us every advantage, and procured an instructor to teach us music and other branches of education. The first day he gave me the dedication of the spectator to read, and I heard Dr. S. tell him, that was an extraordinary child, and would, if a boy, make a brilliant figure. I told them to teach me what they pleased and observed to them I thought it hard they would not teach me Greek and Latin because I was a girl. They laughed and said women ought not to know those things, and mending, writing, arithmetic, and music was all I could be permitted to acquire. I thought of this often, with deep regret, and began to despise those acquirements which were considered inferior to the others. I had a good genius for music. Old Tracy, my master, then held singing in contempt, and the talent which had afforded such pleasure to my father was laid aside. I never sang, but I disliked Tracy, and vented my indignation against him. For saying those who liked singing knew nothing of music, I could have trampled on the reptile, who thus, as I thought, did injustice to the taste of my lamented father. I had no respect for my master, and treated him often with contempt. My sister joined me to torment him. He knew not how to make us respect him. He was really much attached to both, would indulge us frequently by telling long stories of Carolina where he had lived with Arthur Middleton. At other times he tried to make us obey him, and he punished us by obliging us to practice music. This had the effect of making it hateful to both, particularly to me. I acquired great proficiency in arithmetic, and as Tracy excelled in this, and wrote an elegant hand, I resolved to equal him in both. Often, after doing, without any assistance, the most difficult sums and questions he could set, and writing what he acknowledged to be better than his own, I have asked with all the dignity I could assume what right he had to command me, who could play half my time, and learn all he could teach me, I used to go to another room to get my lesson, and soon understanding it would lean on a window seat with my eyes fixed on the river and the Maryland, and look back to the time when my father lived, and I used to play on the green before him. I was not happy. My mother had another set of children. Patty and I were kept very strictly. When released from Tracy, we were obliged to do a certain portion of needlework and often compelled to practice lessons of music. Dr. Stewart was kind to us, but he was not our father. We had one pleasure, going two days every week to the dancing school. I was sick when the master first came to instruct us, and my sister made some progress. I heard everyone praise her, and felt impatient to be well that I might dance too. I recovered, and after a few observations was satisfied it was easy. To dance well. I became the best dancer at the school, and was always placed at the head of the set. I kept the first place of the dancing school. I not only danced well, but conducted myself properly, never interfered with others, and treated my master with respect. He was a genteel man, and always gave me credit for my exertions to attain excellence and the accomplishment he was employed to teach me. It was at the dancing school I formed an acquaintance with Maria Motzer and her sisters. She was the same age, and was placed next to me in the dance. She yielded the post of honor without contention or regret, 
and the affection i felt for her rewarded hers for me my sister nelly went to this school too liked many other girls my attachment was confined to maria on entering the room we met with joy and taking hands and after kissing each other we seated ourselves and took no notice of anything else till called to dance after which we resumed our station and as she always stood next to me when the set was called our conversation was not interrupted the schoolgirls called me proud but they said nothing else of me for i never injured them or said any word to wound their feelings four days in every week were devoted to tracy the others we went to the dancing school i found his instruction irksome i learnt with such ease all he taught that i soon despised my tutor the election of general washington to the presidency was a cause of regret to himself and of much affliction to his family it would take him our grandmother sister and brother and our old nurse too from us our hearts were filled with sorrow we had gone often to mount vernon where mr lear was employed as tutor for the children and after school hours used to sport about the grounds and returned where i always was most happy to the arms of our grandmamma my mother carried us to stay till she departed and the last days of their stay i never left her but to roam with my old nurse that i was to lose them i remember well what i felt when the negroes came to take leave of their mistress to bid her farewell and bless her for all her goodness to them i see them now many bent down with years and infirmities their heads silvered by time uncovered as they bowed and their voices resound in my ears god bless you all as the carriage drove off how pleasant had been this ride but it was to carry me home and next day my grandmother was to leave me i did not sleep all night and next morning i saw my friends depart with agonies which to recount at this distant period makes my heart ache this event was a serious injury to my health and marred my happiness i had been ill with a nervous fever some months before for twenty-one days my fever did not abate and no one believed i should live for several months i could not walk mammy molly came to nurse me my grandmother often visited me and i almost regretted getting well which was to take them from me the distress i suffered at parting with my beloved friend succeeding this threw me in a bad state of health i was melancholy lamented the loss of my friends and the greatest pleasure i enjoyed was to receive their letters and answer them general was so ill that his life was despaired of and we felt much distress till assured of his safety the guardian angel of america was near and preserved her godlike hero the period approached where we were again to see those most dear to us at length austin my grandmother's footman came on a day before to tell us they were near my mother was then confined with her third child and patty and i were half crazy for joy when the carriage stopped i could scarcely stand i wept for joy my grandmother and the children embraced me first then my dear old nurse all wondered at my growth and improvement and i was proud to be admired by them mrs washington came some hours before the president at length he rode out with two gentlemen his secretaries my heart bid me fly to meet him but how could i walk across a long passage in presence of the strangers i hesitated blushed and troubled but my grandmother saying go my darling or the general will think you do not love him this remark gave me strength to reach his chair and his arms supported his timid child i was in great trouble at being obliged to sit at the head of the table extreme sensibility and retired life had given me diffidence which was remarked by all who saw me and was painful to myself the strangers gazed at me and i could not eat at dinner the general said 
that although he thought a young girl looked best when blushing, yet he was concerned to see me suffer so much. My grandmother asked my mother to let her carry me home with her, and I went with pleasure. <laughs> yet the tear bedewed my cheek when I went to bid my mother farewell. We were to meet again in a few weeks. I was to go to Mount Vernon, yet when I saw her pale and feeble, my heart was filled with sorrow. She urged me to go, but the pleasure I felt in being with my grandmother was damped by the thought that my parent was absent and not well, and I did not feel happy till she joined us at Mount Vernon. We were all happy together for several months, but our friends were soon to leave us, and another circumstance occurred to give us pain. In a former part of this narrative I remarked that my father's generous soul had made him regardless of money. While his ignorance of business exposed him to injury from bad men, it was found that the bargain he had made for Abingdon would be ruinous to his children. He had sold valuable estates for paper money, and the sort he was paid in was of no value. Dr. S. had been zealously engaged to extricate the estates from embarrassments, and was advised to give up that place, rather than hold it and be subject to a suit which might take all the personal property. My father died without a will. The laws of that time gave all lands to the male heir when no will existed, and all the girls could have was a portion of the personal estate. My mother wished to save a fortune for her daughters, and resolved to relinquish a residence to which she was much attached, and bury herself in solitude. She made a great sacrifice for us, the place she was to remove to was one Dr. S. had purchased with the wish which all people have to acquire property. Dr. S. was unqualified to deal with one of the most deceitful men I ever heard of. The place had nothing to recommend. It was twenty miles from Alexandria. Okay, and that is the end of the letter. <laughs> so uh, it cuts off sort of abruptly there. Thank you very much for listening. Um, that's all for this week's episode, but we will pick this right up again in two weeks when I post the exciting conclusion where we discuss it. Um, thank you very much for listening. I am, as ever, your most obedient and humble servant. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. It's Catherine again. I just wanted to pop in and say thank you so much to everyone who's been listening. We recently hit 10,000 downloads of the podcast. Actually, I think we're up to like 11,000 downloads, uh, which is better than I ever imagined for this little history podcast that I made. So thank you so much. Um, again, if you want to share and spread the love, feel free to talk about it to your friends or on social media. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook or on Twitter uh, or on Tumblr. I don't post there very much, but we do have a Tumblr. Uh, and you can find us anywhere at H-U-M-S-E-R-V-T. I wanted to give a shout out to Carol from Houston, who recommended the podcast to a, a newsletter, the Marketplaces Make Me Smart group, and they featured the podcast in that group. So anybody listening from that newsletter, hello. I'm complimented that you think I'm going to make you smarter. <laughs> and thank you so much to Carol for passing that along. That was so sweet. And I think it did give us some listeners. Uh, if you have any letters that you would like to recommend that the podcast cover, if you have suggestions, feel free to contact us over at, uh, contact me at the website. It's H-U-M-S-E-R-V-T dot com. Uh, you can see all of our old episodes and old show notes, and there's a pretty easy contact form uh, where you can send anything you'd like. So thank you. Uh, if you'd like to support the podcast in that way, or if you want to spend a couple bucks on buying me a coffee, uh, you can do all of that from our website. Once again, thank you so much for listening. I am so grateful to everybody who's tuned into the podcast, uh, and I look forward to giving you more content. Thank you very much. Bye.